good evening friends first of all wishing everyone a very happy world ip day it falls on the 26th april every year uh, we chose this to be saturday so that our able and distinguished speakers can uh, come and share their views uh, the theme of this world ip day is women in ip our moderator and speakers are going to throw more light on it precisely it's about celebrating the contribution of women in the field of ip or encompassing their work through ip also it is talking about gender bias and specifically certain efforts which can be made while encouraging women in participating and creativity innovation as well as ip creation so i would like to introduce the speakers our first speaker is dr darshini shah darshini ban is from the shelby multi speciality hospital she is a dental cosmetic and implantology doctor she has pioneered single sitting painless root canal treatment and single sitting loading implants these are the innovative efforts from dr darshini ban having worked in the western world it was the ardent desire and passion of dr darshini shah to bring the latest advancements and equipments in the dentistry field to india for the masses in the medical and surgical fields of modern den dentistry dominated by men till yester years dr darshini over the last 24 years has made a distinct difference and emerged as most sought after dental cosmetologist and surgeon today starting her enterprise with a single chair in 1994 at vijay shelby hospital amdavad and subsequently establishing a state of art dental care at sg shelby with five chairs shelby dental and cosmetic and implantology center under her able leadership has grown today to an enterprise with seven center of excellence across india patients from different parts of the developed developing and underdeveloped countries not only visit shelby as a preferred medical tourism center but also for getting rectified dental treatments failed elsewhere many cases of such nature have been successfully treated at shelby dental center by the hands of dr darshini dr darshini has trained several professionals in this field i welcome dr darshini our second distinguished speaker is dr amrita chakrabarti she is assistant professor media and communication from school of liberal studies pandit deen dayal energy Un university gandhinagar she has experience of more than 14 years which encompasses roles in academics secondary market research marketing counseling journalism and operation management she has worked with leading corporate brands such as deloitte ramoji film city nit and ims a ugc net qualified scholar she has a phd in digital government public relation from pdeu she has an ma in journalism and mass communication from tripura central university and a post graduate diploma in business administration in marketing from symbiosis center of distance learning i welcome uh, dr amrita the third speaker of the day is dr n lalitha a former professor gujarat institute of development research dr lalitha began her career at gidr in 1994 
trained in economics, her research focuses on issues around globalization, trade, and development. In the area of globalization, she had focused on issues related to pharmaceutical patents and geographical indications. She had recently completed a research project on socio-economic impact of protecting handicrafts through geographical indications, choosing select products from four southern states of India. She had written in referred books and journals on access issues related to both patented and generic medicines. As part of the letter, she has studied the Tamil Nadu government model of providing essential drugs and prepared the health accounts for government of Gujarat for year 2005 and 6. She co-edited a book titled India's Trist with BT Cotton Learning from First Decade, published by Concept Publishing Company Private Limited, New Delhi. Mitigating the adverse impact of globalization on producer groups by emphasizing on adoption of production and labor standards is gaining rapid approval among the big retailers in agriculture supply chain. She had examined the role of voluntary standards such as fair trade and rainforest alliance in the context of cotton and tea in India. She had been a visiting scholar at Institute of Industrial Relations, University of California, Berkeley, University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Maison del Science Home, Paris, and University Père Mendes, France, Grenoble. I welcome uh, Dr. Lalita. Here comes the road, the moderator, Dr. Nidhi Ridabuch. A uh, known face at AMA, yet I would like to introduce. Uh, Dr. Nidhi is Assistant Professor of Law and Head Placement Internship Division and Center for IPR at Gujarat National University, GNLU Gandhinagar. Dr. Nidhi has over 12 years of teaching experience at undergraduate and postgraduate level. She earned her doctoral degrees from Gujarat National Law University in the area of intellectual property rights. Her thesis focused on jurisdictional issues in the post-TRIPS IP regime in India with particular reference to trademark violations. She graduated in economics, pursued law, and obtained LLM from commercial law specialization. She has also completed postgraduate diploma in intellectual property rights. She gained wide experience as a consultant on intellectual property rights with National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, during the years 2001 to 4. She was exposed to for policy framing for protection of IP generated by faculties and students of the state institute. She drafted guidelines for protection of intellectual property, which were made part of institute's formal regulation. She is associated with various law schools and management institute in the capacity of a visiting faculty. Being a qualified advocate, she has also worked in the chamber of senior advocate at Gujarat High Court. She is actively associated with Gujarat State Judicial Academy as a visiting faculty, in part imparting training to newly recruited judicial magistrates for the state of Gujarat. Presently, she is offering a course on IP rights to undergraduate students and a course on law of trademark and geographical indications to the postgraduate students of GNLU. Moreover, in the capacity of director, the center of excellence on IP rights at GNLU, she is actively involved in teaching research and extension activities organized by the centers. For, uh, for an instance, Microsoft India Chair for Intellectual Property Rights and GNLU, Gujarat Council on Science and Technologies Guch Coast Research Center of Excellence on IP Laws, Policies and Practices. She has been recently nominated to be a member of committee for drafting IP policy for Central University of Gujarat she has significantly contributed in the drafting of IP policy for university, which is pending for final approval. I welcome Dr. Nidhi. Dr. 
now the floor is open for the ip discussions over to you nidhi ban thank you very much thank you very much gopi uh, the i think the generous introduction probably has made of us little nervous all of us i would say because it was little lengthier uh, thank you for that i'll uh, put this particular uh, as a moderator i am well aware of the fact that i am not here to speak i am here to influence them to speak so i'll stick to that role and uh, uh, just would like to take this opportunity to put this discussion in context so that those who are here would you would find this inter with uh, find this interaction more relevant and interesting we have gathered here to celebrate uh, the world intellectual property day which happens to be on 26th and as rightly pointed out by gopi we are discussing it on saturday night to uh, saturday evening to mark that celebration uh, what is the reason that we are celebrating it with the uh, women panel the reason is the theme the theme of wipo wipo every year comes out with very interesting theme for <clears throat> for uh, this uh, day and celebrating it this time wipo has come out with a theme which is as mentioned women and ip accelerating innovation and creativity the focus is women and ip in fact uh, in fact if we consider the mm, consider the dynamic of ip and development women have a very significant role to play so how that is to be considered and how the sustained realization of role of women in society can be put to context is probably the rational behind this particular theme uh, if we talk about creativity and innovation it no no bounds and it it uh, it neither has you know any tribe any gender any color so it is across and it is to to put the society on the path of progress however we are well aware of the fact that uh, the and we all agree with the global debate on uh, women and uh, pervasive culture of uh, gender bias and we definitely agree that concrete action and steps are required to be taken that is something which definitely has been the focus of wipo once again and they are drawing this uh, they are bringing this theme to us for drawing our attention to the role women are playing as far as ip is concerned uh, in fact uh, <clears throat> uh just uh, i think uh, this year uh, un women that is the global agency that uh, uh, that uh, met and that is specially working for promotion of gender uh, equality and empowerment of women in their 67th session uh, of the commission on the status of women re uh, reaffirmed that in order to address the issue of gender parity we or bring about gender parity in all aspects the role of education technology science and innovation has key role to play so that is also something which is part of the rational behind this particular theme uh, the important factor which we cannot uh, overlook is the numerical strength that the women are having that is 50% of the population of the world is women and if women <coughs> are given sufficient space to grow with the innovation because there are number of issues that are being faced with regard to starting from because ip is a journey concept to commercialization and at every level at every stage some sort of assistance in one or the other way is required irrespective of gender it's not only women irrespective of gender that assistance is required somewhere something is wrong due to which that assistance equally is not available that is also something which is part of this rational that we are talking about as far as the theme is concerned further if we talk about how important uh, the uh, uh, further when i was uh, drawing your attention to the numerical strength it's not just the numerical strength but it is also the uh, also the um, 
uh, role that the women have played. So while, to, you know, while just uh, getting myself prepared for this particular session, I came across the role which is being played by women, starting from all these uh, invention or innovation that I'm talking about and naming are all being undertaken by women. From the invention of the dishwasher in homes, the ma making of solar cells, fiber optic cables, portable fax machines, touchstone telephones, caller ID and call waiting, the development of global positioning system, popularly known as GPS, a precursor to the navigation system that we enjoy today, the first discovery of DNA structure to the development of stem cell isolation technique, and many more revolutionary inventions, women have contributed for the upliftment of society. So how to recognize this role and how to, how to appreciate and celebrate their contribution as far as IP development is concerned. That's the rationale behind this particular theme. And that's the reason we have this notable panelist among us who have made mark in the field through their innovation and problem solving approach. So for that, uh, I think I take this opportunity to go to each one of them one after the other with few questions playing my role of being moderator. So I think uh, we can start uh, with a couple of common questions that I will put to all panelists, starting with uh, <coughs> Darshini Ben. Uh, the first question that uh, I think uh, comes to mind is what do you think is the role of innovation and problem solving approach in development of any organization? Good evening. Thank you, Gopi, for inviting me and sharing the dais with the most distinguished and accomplished ladies. Thank you so much. So coming to your question, uh, Nidhiban, role of innovation. Innovation plays a very significant and pivotal role in any organization. It upgrades the operating system completely. Suppose any organization is at certain level. It is going with certain pace. And at the same time, any innovation coming in and implementing that innovation will reduce the operational complexity. It will make the system to run, system and processes to run much faster, easier, and hassle-free. And that's how in, say, if it is uh, customer-centric, then customers would be satisfied. And if it is healthcare-related, the patients would be very, very happy with the services which we provide through innovation. It is like a growth engine. I think innovation is like a growth engine for any organization. And uh, it will affect the whole, it will rather upgrade the whole system. And uh, if, I, if I tell you my experience that uh, we started our journey with, uh, uh, I am from a medical and surgical background, but we started our journey with six bedded hospital. Now we are, running the hospital chain of uh, Shelby Institute, uh, having 2,000 bedded hosp uh, hospitals, hospital chain across India. So this, has, this would have never happened without implementing different types of innovations in our journey. See, if I look back, in hindsight, if I see in 1990s, what was the scenario in medical and uh, surgical sciences? The science and technology has come up a far way, far away. In a way, uh, it has introduced a lot of newer technologies and it, it is really benefited to the patients. Suppose if I, if I tell in 2007 when we, we opened up our uh, new hospital, previously it was a small unit of six beds, so it was like uh, you can manage it uh, with uh, a small number of staff and anything. But with the pneumatic shaft implementation, it's 12 story building. So while operating in the surgical units, the surgeons need immediately within few seconds the report from the pathology lab. So pneumatic shaft was, it was not never an invention or innovation for uh, Western country maybe, but for India, yes. And it gives the report in seconds. 
because it is it is like a shaft and drill so it is like a shaft and drill so from 12th floor to the ground floor it comes in a second the report comes in a second so it was so useful i think no human can match this so this kind of implementation implementation of uh, innovation helps a lot it's like a fresh breath for the unit thank you very much uh, i think i'll go to dr lalita and then we'll go to dr amrita hello yes uh, thanks so much uh, for inviting me in this forum and uh, to gopi and uh, nidhi um, when i when she spoke to me she said i should uh, stick to the area of uh, geographical indications so um, applying your question on innovation to geographical indications uh, in geographical indication is basically uh, it is to preserve the heritage or the traditional value so there is as such there is no innovation but what i found in my journey in this field uh, is when uh, you know because geographical indication is uh, given to the community so there are so many producers producing the similar products so where where do you stand uh, in that where do you show your innovation and this innovation comes when people challenge themselves because they will have to if they have to earn a good return so then they will have to show that they are better than others in terms of uh, qu this quality so in that what producing a quality product yes if you are going to stick to the standards then you are going to produce but when the, the competition is severe what do you do and I, when i had uh, an opportunity to study uh, these uh, handicrafts from the southern states i had an opportunity to visit uh, the bhavani uh, area in tamil nadu koyamathur uh, where they produce the carpets it is called uh, if you look at the gi it is called bhavani jamakalam it is a gi product and it is a very uh, 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 unique product in that sense there is not much of innovation possible in the kind of because they are all producing the similar kind of design a horizontal design product but due to the uh, kind of uh, challenges from the power loom uh, operators this hand loom woven uh, carpets you know the it started declining and where you find a number of women weavers and they use the pit loom it's very tough to operate actually and uh, what they were doing because the, it was declining and there is not much of sales happening so the raw materials from the government also declines only when you sell then you get more so many people started leaving that field so it was left with women who were engaged in that uh, time when i had gone to the field so what they were doing was so using the same pit loom they started producing the spiritual images you know using this silk yarn so the same loom was used but they were producing this different product and this product happened to be it is not uh, it is something closer to the uh, tanjavur painting in the sense it can you know, like a wall hanging they were producing so it is not as expensive as the tanjavur painting but it is not very cheap also so in between something and uh, because they were using the silk yarn the produce looks very grand and it is very suitable for you know gifting on occasions and uh, uh, as such so it was a great innovation because it because of the challenge there is a declining market for that and there is a severe competition because whomsoever is you know there are co cooperative societies operating and there is not much of uh, differences in the product so in that if you have to stand then what they did was so using the same thing you go to the different product and i also found another innovation in that what they were doing they started instead of the same horizontal line uh, they started using you know producing the alphabets alphabets both in tamil and in english okay and this product you know you use it as a curtain and this was used in the classrooms in both in the anganwadis as well as in the adult education so they you know first they started with the alphabets and the jacket looms were used so when they use this uh, alphabets and then slowly uh, graduated to the numbers and then small addition subtraction so it was such a great idea i thought you know you were engaged in a product which is which doesn't have much scope because people it is thick the, the carpet is very thick and uh, and the the climate uh, that is prevailing in south india it's mostly you know very hot 
So there is not much of scope in using this carpet on a day-to-day -day basis. So only you see these things in marriage halls and other things. So this was a great innovation using the same technique, but you produce a product and which is a great appeal because you know, in the Anganwadis, instead of making them right, you say, say this is this is A, this is a, this is one, two, and it it picked up. And so I thought this was a fantastic idea. And similarly, the, I saw in the field of Aran Mula mirror. And so that mirror itself is a very cute stuff because it's not an ordinary mirror made of chemicals. It is a metallic one. So there, uh, this, this product, uh, one of the women entrepreneurs, she had just come out with that. What she was doing, again here, the, the, the trade secret is the way you mix the alloys to produce that mirror. Okay. So that is retained with the producers and they will give the metal to their workers. Okay? So they will mix the metal and give the work. And so the differences among the 15 or uh, 20 odd producers who, who own that uh, GI, it was basically in the kind of frames that you produce. You know? So that makes a distinction and it makes uh, the sizes, of course. So this particular uh, women entrepreneur, what she did was she started making pendants. Okay, the small mirror, which is used in all auspicious occasions and uh, you know housewarming ceremonies and all they gifted. So she started making the pendants, and that pendant had such a great appeal among the youngsters, and it picked up. And uh, she was planning to scale it up because when I had gone, she had just introduced that product. And uh, so this, this, you know, where you stand, uh, you know, separate in this competition, you stand apart. So that I found even in the crafts which were declining. And the, the innovation here is to keep the craft alive by using the same kind of resource, but how efficiently, how sustainably you use. So this is this field of geographical edition. And in this, I saw these women were standing apart. And this touched my heart. And um, you know, in geographical integration, that's what you get uh, very fascinated because you want to consume or you want to own such a product. And there, I learned a lesson also in this. You know, how in even in the kind of the difficult times, how they were innovating and then they were sustaining the craft. Thank you. Thank you so much for drawing our attention to evolution of innovation because as you rightly pointed out geographical indication is something which is already innovated the process in the process of recognizing it we simply recognize it and try to uh, take benefit out of it and continue with the craft but how that particular process is developed with the help of this kind of innovative approach on part of those who are working. So thank you very much for giving this uh, a different uh, perspective to innovation and the role of women with this question. I'll go to Dr. Amritana. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be in this panel. And uh, instead, uh, I'm learning from both the speakers. So, uh, well, um, as I'm an academic, I'm not an expert in intellectual property right, uh, but uh, I have done some groundwork as being a panelist today. So, uh, I primarily teach public relations uh, in my university, and as this is an event of Ahmedabad Management Association, so I thought of taking some examples from business and management point of view. So uh, I would like to take the example of a program known as Shark Tank, okay, which is quite a you know, popular program these days. Uh, first of all, while addressing your first question that uh, you know, how innovation is important for the growth of any business, it definitely helps in the growth of revenue. Okay, point number one, it helps to uh, make a brand as a market leader because if anything comes with innovation, there is every scope that the brand can become the market leader of that category. And uh, it creates a brand loyalty among customers. Okay, so customers can be loyal to your brand and they can think that, okay, like, uh, for example, even Sony. Sony, when we say Sony as a brand, uh, we, we consider Sony as a television first of all. Okay, but if Sony launches this air conditioner, then we will think about Lloyd or Daikin or some other, you know, brands. So that way, like, the loyalty comes in. And there are many other plus points related to this. Now, because today we are going to talk about the involvement of women and intellectual property. So I'm just referring to one of the episodes of Shark Tank. Uh, there I saw that uh, there was one of the competitor uh, who was a woman, and she actually dressed herself like a 
Lady Yamraj, okay, very innovatively dressed, and her her portfolio or her proposal for the business was that she was giving a package for cremation. Okay, when someone dies, okay, she was giving a package of cremation to take up the entire responsibility of cremation, starting from you know taking the body from the hospital to bringing it home and to follow all the rituals as per the religion that the prospective customers belong to. Whichever religion it is, Muslim, Hindu, Christian or whatever, they will follow all the rituals, help the family members to get all the basic ingredients to follow the rituals because the family members will be devastated at that big, you know, point in time. And then finally, taking care of the entire cremation process. So the only thing is that one needs to pay them. Okay, so uh, like in that program, actually, I found that uh, two of the uh, panelists said that no, I don't, we don't want to invest because this is related to death. Okay, but the thing is that look at the innovation. Okay, she has already launched the business and she is already getting business out of the entire idea. So if if this is not innovation, then what is it? Okay, she actually brought a business out of death, and to addressing some of the very crisis situation of our life. And I think if some, a child is born, then we are all destined to leave this world someday. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to put my remark here. Thank you, thank you very much. That's such an excellent idea, right? That, uh, you know, somebody is uh, getting business out of death, but how, to, how that reality is converted into innovation and uh, how uh, innovation and problem solving approach is playing a role. I think now I'll go with, you know, clubbing of uh, two aspects together in a question. Uh, uh, the first question, uh, first part of the question is, how do you think that IP as an enabler has played role in your career and also the challenges that you have faced? along with that. Both the things together, and I think uh, we can take a reverse turn and we can start uh, with you. Well, uh, as being an academic, uh, my uh, exposure to intellectual property right was related to my research papers and my book. I actually converted my PhD thesis into a book. My PhD thesis was to study the Twitter handle of Digital India Initiative. Okay, I studied the Digital India Initiative's Twitter handle for one year, and I uh, di dig deep into it about what is the what are the uh, you know initiatives they are prioritizing, how they are influencing people. So uh, now, uh, actually, honestly speaking, I uh, while publishing the book, I didn't face any challenge. Uh, that was for only for me that I fa I didn't face any challenge. But on the other side. If it is anything related to getting a book published by an international publisher, then uh, anybody would face a lot of challenge, okay? In terms of, the first thing is in terms of rejection, okay? And the second thing is that in terms of review with the number of, you know, reviewing process. So that actually takes a lot of time for anyone to go through, maybe even more than two years. So one of my colleague actually, um, a lady colleague, she has actually published her uh, uh, PhD uh, into a book uh, through Routledge publisher, okay? And it actually took uh, close to three years, okay, for her to publish the book. It was because she was patient enough to go through the entire process, continuously working on revisions one after the other. So this is one thing, and uh, the other thing is that uh, in terms of filing a patent uh, for an academic, it needs a lot of research. It needs, the, the, the first thing is that uh, it really needs to give a clarity to the authorities about how this research is going to be useful to the world or useful to the humanity. So even if you have created the best of the thing and you are not able to put a judgment or you are not able to give a validation of how your innovation is going to be useful to the world or useful to humanity, your case will not be, or your research will not be patented. Okay, so these are serious challenges and uh, you know, going further I will talk about my experience to talk with one of my colleagues uh, who filed a patent uh, very recently. So with this I'll end here.
Thank you very much. You have highlighted both uh, how uh, IP, in fact, uh, uh, as far as the academicians are concerned, the best way to be known to the world is through your publication. And that's the path, uh, you know. So IP definitely is an enabler because when we go for publication, definitely copyright uh, impliedly comes with it. So you are looking at uh, uh, that part of IP in your career and also some of the challenges that you have put forward. Uh, Dr. Um, when I joined GIDR in uh, 1994, uh, I had started uh, some work related to industrial policy and also the then, the, the then director of GIDR, Professor Praveen Visarya, and he, he had a discussion and uh, he said, so look, there are a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies in Gujarat because I had just moved from south to Gujarat. And uh, he said, see, the WTO has been established and there is, uh, people are talking about TRIPS agreement. I think uh, our institute should uh, do some work in this area. So why don't you write some proposals? So then it, the journey started. I started looking for what is WTO, what is TRIPS agreement. Then I wrote a proposal and uh, I think the process I met with uh, Admin Pooch in the, my earlier years. Like what is patent? So then this, you know, because my background is economics. So and what I'm talking is about science and innovation. So where am I landing myself? But I found the journey to be super, super. Because in those early years when I started you know, looking at what is a TRIPS agreement, what is each class is telling and how it is going to be impacting the pharmaceutical industry in India and elsewhere. And it was very fascinating and in many forums for many years, I, you know, I had been the only woman who is talking about and the non-science person. And uh, one thing led to the another because I was looking at the synthetic industry and then when I realized there is not much of, there is people are focusing more on reverse engineering, I wanted to look at what is happening on the traditional medicine side. So how this uh, Siddha and Ayurveda medicines, how are they protecting themselves? So that led to the journey of looking at the Siddha practitioners. And that's the time I was invited to be a teacher at uh, NIPER, the National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education Research uh, Gujarat, uh, which was located in Ahmedabad then. So they invited me to uh, uh, take a class, this, uh, handle this intellectual property and management, technical management course, so which continued for about seven years. And uh, then, because I'm talking to the pharma students, so each class I used to take, you know, do a lot of homework, read all the patent related information, and then the students used to ask me what is happening in the biotechnology field. So I used to do a lot of homework, and again, I took up a project on biotechnology pharma. So like that, I covered all this pharma industry. Then the realization occurred, okay, when we are talking about innovation and patents here, there is one company or one individual who is getting benefited. So what is happening to the geographical indication, so which is happening, you know, which is given to the community and a large number of community members are holding that. So who is benefiting by that? So then I took up a project, then I was doing something on pharma, because the pharma field also took me to study the French pharmaceutical industry and Canadian pharmaceutical industry. So then when, when I said, look, let me look at this field. So then I gradually shifted to geographical indications and then yes, the journey is going on still. Thank you Thank so you. much. I think uh, what Dr. Lalita tried to highlight is how she was feeling, uh, you know, not uh, being able to contribute to the field of IP, not being a science person. But I think IP is one such field which is when you talk about IP law, you certainly talk about the legislative framework. But, there are, but otherwise, IP means innovation. And as I mentioned, innovation has no bound. So IP rights, IP laws, you talk about legislation. But otherwise, whatever is created, Created. anybody can create and it is one field of law which has very strong interface with almost all disciplines so starting from pharma to management to all because you have to so teaching patent to my student not having science background I still get butterfly because I feel somehow I will not be able to explain the invention which is the base then you understand the invention then you appreciate the patent which is granted over it 
So that is something which is there. But coming from the field of economics, you have ventured to you know uh, research in these areas is definitely conveying that being innovative is sufficient if you want to do something with IP. So I think that is something yeah. which uh, is a very good. Uh, yeah. Just uh, to add to away. that, because <laughs> this knowledge and the social side of what was happening in the pharmaceutical and the uh, you know when you start writing about how the patent is going to be impacting. So that was uh, kind of uh, very, uh, you know, not much of knowledge was there at that point of time. So I think that's where my contribution in terms of what, uh, you know, uh, my writings uh, were uh, accepted and appreciated and which gave me a lot of encouragement to continue work in this field. So that is what number of people who are writing about for IP, they do not come from the background. IP laws also, when they are, because you, when you're writing about it, when you're researching about it, the law certainly would come somewhere in play, but then not necessarily you belong to the field of law, you can still uh, contribute a law, uh, lot as far as this field is concerned. I think uh, we will be able to know much more about uh, on this line from Dr. Dashini also. Please, ma'am. According to me, IP is one of the most intangible asset which contributes, uh, contributes to uh, greater economic growth, business development and industrial revolution. And that trickles down to number of other aspects of business like uh, uh, it increases the better product line, uh, there are better services, more efficiency in the business, uh, increases the market share, profit making assets and the branding activity. Everything uh, is related to uh, intellectual property rights. And thus, how, thus uh, you can increase the export also. And finally, uh, it affects the GDP of the country. And if I think about my field or dental field or my husband's field or Shelby Orthopedic Hospital, we started with uh, two branches, orthopedic and dental. But slowly, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, science, technology, and with implementation of every innovative thing in the procedure and uh, procedural benefits to the patient, I think uh, my husband and myself, we have, may not say invented, but innovated a lot of things in a way that when we started, my husband was doing uh, knee replacement. It was totally a new procedure, which was not penetrated in India at that time. I'm talking about 1993, 1994. And people were not aware about what is to total knee replacement. And they were so afraid. And all over India, it was hardly maybe 200 to 300 operations were done. Right now, today, my husband is doing about 7,000 knee replacements single-handedly in my institution. So that is the whole journey of excellence, we can say. And when I was doing dental implants at that time, so it was like we, I had to put the cut and major cuts. And right now, before you going to your workplace, I can finish that procedure in five to 10 minutes. So that is the innovation and IP has enabled us, means uh, we are taking help of Vaiju Trivedi and company. They are experts and for our uh, trademarks and everything, we have uh, more than Shelby as a flagship unit. Uh, we have 160 uh, trademark uh, registered and uh, our subsidiary uh, 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 Sleni, pharmaceuticals, it has got uh, about 60 trademarks registered. And now we have bought over one implant manufacturing company, company in California, uh, which is already having patents of its own. And uh, uh, we are working on uh, new ambition joints, as well as we are coming up with, instead of total knee, we are coming, with, coming up with partial knee replacements, which would be very much benefited to the patients. Thank you.
thank you dr darshini for highlighting and you know actually showing that how ip is playing a role by because you've gone for trademark registration you've also accepted patented technology and in true sense that way ip has been an enabler as far as your career path is concerned uh, now uh, with regard to the theme that we have today and one of the major aspects that i highlighted earlier also while giving the background about this particular session was how how women uh, and their role can be identified and how uh, socio economic development of society as whole and also women upliftment through ip protection can be generated so i think uh, i would request uh, dr lalita to share her thoughts on uh, as what is her perspective on uh, women upliftment through ip protection uh, talking about the geographical indications area <coughs> i find because in uh, india we have close to about uh, 430 uh, registrations have been done and of which almost uh, nearly 60% is in handicrafts so which includes the uh, textiles and uh, uh, craft works so in this in this and plus the agricultural uh, gis if you see there are lot of women working in this area so what i find um, you know given the size of the country the number of registrations are very low okay but i belong to this school of thought where there are many people who think gi should be given only for those products which have fa which are facing competition in the export market but i view it differently i think gi should be given for all those product where we can prove their this some heritage value traditional value due to the geographical location of that because we are talking about the cultural identities and if we are not able to do that then we are going to be facing the cultural erosion of that place and when we say cultural erosion what we are losing is the kind of traditional knowledge that is associated with women because both in the craft as well as in the agricultural field what i what i have seen is women are holding this knowledge of say how to protect the seeds for the next season and in the craft in the pre looming stage in weaving how they uh, you know uh, do all the preparatory work so this is uh, fantastic so but most of the time they don't know that this is such a wonderful unique product that they are cultivating or producing so that's where you will have to bring in some institutional arrangement to say yes please this is a brick product that you are producing a very unique product it's a you know it's a cultural asset of this region which needs to be protected but they don't know that so that's where i think if we are able to do bring in more products and then make it aware you know to other regions in the country because most of the time even in this digital era and now the things are changing but otherwise what is produced in kutch is not known in other areas so similarly in what is produced in south or east it's not widely known okay. so that's where we really, if you make an awareness of these products the unique products we will be doing a lot of lot of justice to the women who are behind those products who are producing those products who are having such big huge traditional knowledge that's why it's fascinating when we study the geographical indications area because we are talking about women empowerment so how to reduce the uh, hunger the so many the sustainable development goals that we talk about it's all interrelated and where women are there you know so if you are able to do this identify these products and then bring it to the market and even sustain them we are doing a lot of we are giving to the society a lot thank you so much i think dr lalita highlighted two things uh, awareness and assistance because uh, through her work in the area of geographical indication probably she has come across number of such women group who are uh, who are engaging themselves into such product creation and they are just not aware what is the value of it so if that awareness is generated and further assistance is needed now that is something which is very important if that assistance is provided then i think it can certainly help because they'll be able to identify their own rights and they'll be able to protect their own rights and when you know their their innovation takes shape of rights definitely some sort of economic benefits can be assured so thank you for highlighting that i think uh, with the same question if i go to dr amrita so uh, while addressing this uh, question i would like to take uh, the reference of the research of my phd scholar and uh, she is studying the activities of the women entrepreneurs in bihar uh so uh 
she actually uh, came up with, uh, she actually met and interviewed a couple of them who are having very innovative business. And uh, I would like to quote, uh, one is uh, Namita Azad, 45 years old woman, and she makes doll, handmade doll known as Kanya Putri, okay? Now Kanya Putri is a traditional handmade doll which is normally given by a mother to the daughter when the daughter gets married. And that was a very ancient tradition of Bihar, but that is actually getting dissolved with each passing day. But Namita Azad is bringing it back. And people who actually knew the older tradition, they are actually buying it up and you know, giving it to their daughters. Then she also researched about Amita Kumari, 45 years woman, uh, 45 year old woman, and she makes jute jewelry, show pieces of jute and you know, other accessories of jute. Uh, she has, uh, at present, she has two, 12 women staffs in her business, and she generates 25,000 rupees per month with her jute accessory business. So this is the second woman. The third woman is Manju Devi, 50-year-old woman she is. And Manju Devi makes pickle of 20 different categories. Pickle of jackfruit, pickle, pickle of cauliflower, no, just not the traditional mango and tamarind pickle, but so many different kinds of pickle. But the unique thing is she makes it 100% natural without any chemical preservative in it. How she makes it, only she knows. Okay. And the fourth reference I would like to take is uh, Ruchi Chaudhary. She makes garments uh, and particularly the uniforms for uh, colleges and hospitals. And she has a monthly income of 2 lakh per month. Now, if I take the example of Manju Devi making pickle or Amita Kumari making jute jewelry or uh, Namita Azad making Kanya Putri dolls, none of them, as my PhD scholar said, none of them has any idea about patent, filing patent or intellectual property or, you know, doing a copyright of their products. It's so unique that if you see Kanya Putri, the doll, if you see it, it is very real, very beautiful, but no patent, no copyright, nothing. The problem is that they are not aware about it. Okay, so there should be initiatives to, uh, you know, to educate this woman. However, there are a number of government schemes coming up. I'll talk about it later. Uh, but just that, like, I would like to refer to uh, the talk that I had with one of my colleagues today morning. She is uh, Dr. Sheetal Rawat, um, uh, pass out of PhD from IIT and uh, was working with Bhava Atomic Research earlier and now with my university, Pandit Dindyal Energy University. She filed a patent. She is an assistant professor of physics. And uh, she filed a patent that's a U.S. patent and her patent is on Pulse-shaped discrimination of alpha and gamma radiation. Okay, she filed the patent in 2019, and in 2021, the patent was granted to her, and it is a U.S. patent. So she explained uh, everything about the the particular, you know, research. But then, when I asked her that, you know, what was the what is as being women, uh, what was the challenge that you faced, or do you think that you know people are facing challenge while filing patent? She said that. Despite being from the privileged class of the society, like Namita Azad and all, they are rural women. But she being from the privileged class of the society, a PhD from IIT, working with Bhava Atomic Research as well, she said that there is so much of discrimination, okay, in terms of biasness, in terms of gender biasness, gender discrimination. She said that people are more, people, she said that women are not exposed to the thought that they can file a patent. It is because the way we are brought up, it is the way we have developed the outlook. Okay, and you know, honestly speaking, when I actually search for who else, who are the other women who filed patent in my university, actually I have got only one. But there are so many males who have filed patent. Uh, you know, our director general has so many ma multiple patents he has. Okay, but this is unfortunate. The university is promoting this, the university is supporting, but even, Dr. Sheetal is actually nurturing her child and at the time when she filed the patent, she was pregnant, okay? And now she's into full-time job with a full-time motherhood. So hence it's a challenge. So these are the challenges okay, associated with patent and lack of knowledge to the other class of the society. 
thank you so much for highlighting. I think the I think uh, we all agree that we really need to take certain concrete step to address this disparity, which is across. Uh, IP is not just uh, is is no exception. One can say, and what can be done about this global issue? Uh, of course, in the next uh, part of it, we will uh, uh, discuss this uh, in uh, details. With that question, I would prefer to go to Dr. Dashini now, if you can highlight. So, uh, uh, Amrita, I totally agree with you that uh, 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 even privileged women, they do not know whether they can go for IP or patent uh, uh, application or how to go about and what is the pro process. So, according to me, I think uh, sitting over here, all we are uh, privileged women and we have been given chance to come up in life and education was given the uh, most biggest emphasis uh, in our life by our parents and uh, the society. So, I think we should be very thankful to uh, people around. Uh, so, According to me, when the tree is already grown, I would give the example of a tree. When tree is already grown, it is difficult to get the best of the fruits if we think later. So we should work from the grassroots level. I think education, uh, accessibility of education, training, and uh, awareness, as she mentioned, that there was no awareness. All these things are very, very important right from the childhood and right from the environment at the home because uh, when two siblings are being brought up uh, uh, there is a definite gender biases not in uh, maybe uh, urban area but definitely at the rural area as far as the hygiene or healthcare is concerned or education is concerned and uh, after s certain period of time suppose any girl reaches to puberty or adolescence as soon as uh, they reach that level of education, the children are ready to get them married and, you know, uh, start their uh, family life and because there are a lot of other constraints also for their education to go ahead. So, uh, it's not only IP challenge, but there are a lot of challenges women still face in rural areas, in villages, in towns and we should address. Uh, I think we should break the social mold. I, th I think so. And... Uh, we should help women in coming out of that social mold and uh, so many social obstacles also. Of course, finance would be the one of the, yes. Thank you so much for highlighting that. I think uh, it reminds me of how, you know, in, care, in terms of innovation also, I think uh, Dr. Lalita must have come across this. In some forms of art, uh, one that I am aware of is Patan Patola. That particular art was never used to be taught to the actual weaving to the daughters because the daughters will get married and will go to another family. So that's how that art form will be parted. And that was the way in which it was being protected earlier. So, you know, in fact, when we are talking about uh, women and IP, it's, it's rather impossible to separate these things that have been part and parcel of our societal development and what has been part and parcel of our culture. That is very much part of it and that is something unless that is addressed, I don't think we can understand this uh, IP and development dynamics properly from the perspective of women. So, earlier, because there was no GI, in fact, GI is something which is the latest entry as far as the IP is concerned. But that was the mechanism with which that form of art was being protected because the daughters can and most of the tedious and the cumbersome, cumbersome job which is related to weaving apart from actual weaving will be undertaken by women. But then the actual part will not be performed by them because then if they know how to weave those things, then they will part it with the other, uh, they will uh, go to the other family and uh, it will go there. So there are a number of such issues definitely which are there and not that they were there in past only, they are present in, in uh, pre uh, present world also which requires, uh, uh, which are required to be addressed. Uh, going further with our discussion, I think uh, if we look look at, you know, with those uh, darker sides, with those gray area that we are unable to address since ages, one can say, 
what positive actions can be taken and what do you think how can we promote women to be actively participating in innovation and entrepreneurship because i think the uh, the major issue that has always been highlighted with women workforce is not being able to work on the terms and condition of the employer so if you if you come out with your own entrepreneurship idea and that is something which will give you a particular i think a possibility of uh, dictate your own terms and condition and work and come out with your own innovation so how can we promote women to actively participate in innovation and entrepreneurship with whatever uh, background you have with whatever uh, experience you come from i think uh, our panelists are ideal people you know who can come out with some sort of innovation on this and can uh, suggest certain ways which we can you know take forward and that can help us you know next time when we sit here and talk and discuss about women and ip probably those gray and dark sides we can leave behind and to be more positive about it so for that i think uh, if i can start with you yeah <coughs> so for the upliftment of women in ip protection i would say the first and foremost thing is right guidance and mentoring at each and every level not as when they come to the final outcome or the final year of this thing uh, i mean uh, go for patenting or ip related issues but right from the childhood and their skill should be uplifted they they should be encouraged for and they should be given wings to their dreams actually uh, uh, to fulfill their dreams if they are coming out with any creativity or uh, any brilliant ideas you know or innovation i think the educated people like us should encourage them by uh, investing in their ideas if there is any startup we should encourage their budding ideas and uplift their skill as much as possible uh, as i mentioned earlier also uh, any social obstacles we would definitely find lot of resistance from the parents or from the people in the family and uh, it is our moral responsibility to help them and tap their potential from it thank you so much for highlighting how to tap the potential that women and the girls are having with regard to innovation and how to take it forward i think with that i would prefer to go to dr lalita so i just want to trace my uh, um, work in kondapalli it's a, uh, it's a toy making cluster in uh, andhra pradesh so there when i had gone uh, for, for the ji related study Uh, basically the women here are very beautiful you know they are gifted with the excellent skill of uh, making the toys uh, of course they work with their husbands but the final touches like uh, the eyes and the color the combinations and all it's done by the women so when i had gone i had met with them and then uh, two particular piece of art i loved it and then i took it from them and when i came to the city because i was uh, uh, you know positioned in uh, vijayawada so from there i was traveling to kondapalli so when i came back and then i uh, told uh, some of my relatives and friends that these are the two pieces of art and then i sent the pictures they said we also we need it but then there was no question of me going back to the village because it was a bit far so i said okay let me make a trip to the nearby emporium and then find so and then when i went to the emporium i saw the price for the same art piece was triple the amount okay the, the first thing i realized so what is happening here because he said because i bought it from there uh, and they just they did not have any packing material they just gave those piece of uh, you know craft but here in the emporium it is in the very nice lighting and the air conditioned room the price was triple then then when i went back to kutch in 2019 uh, for a project um then i found it was a superb uh, kind of experience where there was an organization which was working which was picking up all those women uh, the girls particularly and of course the male beavers also they were conducting a course in business administration and they were telling how they should price their product it is not only for the raw material that you had consumed but it is also for the energy that you have used the amount of time that you had spent the amount of assistance that you had used so bring in all these factors and then price your product 
So then when I look at this Kutch model, where the price was, you know, appropriate to the kind of designs and the amount of time and energy that they had spent, it was marvelous. Then I realized, yes, these people require, because first of all, I told you, they did not know that they are producing such a unique craft, okay? So that is the first, the lack of awareness. And the second thing was, they were very contented with the kind of creation that they were doing and the person who is coming and purchasing those craft, or the government emporium or somebody who is coming and purchasing those craft, and that's the, the, the immediate money that they get. But no, never they thought of how they should price the product, how they should sell it to the consumer, that education was not there. If that is there, you know, then the women entrepreneurs, because they are all sitting with a, such kind of wonderful, wonderful traditional knowledge. And these kind of skills are getting eroded. So that's where I feel, yes, this, you know, the education of how to do this business. If that is imparted, then we will be producing a lot of women entrepreneurs. But of course, this the trend is changing. You know, they, there are a lot of kind of institution because when we are talking of business administration, we are talking at the level of MBAs at the city level and IMA and other institutions. No, we require business strategies for these women who are actually engaged, particularly in the field of GI field, but you know, they, we require these business strategies. And then, of course, there is an institution, the collectivization is required because there are individual artists who don't know many of these things. You will have to bring them under a collective umbrella. So that institution, if it is there, which can position their products, their precious products in the market, then we will be doing a lot of things for the women entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting the significance of strategic management, right? I think starting from how to price a product to how to sell it in market that fetches them appropriate price will certainly uplift them that we're talking about. And then, you know, there are other women also who will certainly be, be motivated to venture into this field of entrepreneurship. But there's much which is required to be done as you have rightly pointed out. Dr. Amrita, your thoughts on it now? So, uh, looking into the brighter side of things, uh, across many states, there are many schemes by the state governments to develop the entrepreneurship skills and uh, status of women. So, as like my uh, PhD scholar actually found out about those women, they are actually taking a lot of help from the Bihar government. And uh, when I research about uh, what the Gujarat government is doing, um, I got to know that there is Gujarat Women Economic Development Corporation, okay? And uh, it has schemes, it has different schemes, like one of the scheme is Mahila Swavalamban scheme. And according to that scheme, any woman who can deposit 1.5 lakh from urban area or 1.2 lakh from rural area can avail the scheme where they will be provided training for entrepreneurship in terms of uh, learning skills. Okay, learning skills for traditional and non-traditional activities such as embroidery, soft toy making, you know, working on computers, patchworks, garment manufacturing. So this, this one of a very important initiative is there, which is Mahila Swavalamban scheme. And then there is another initiative known as Mahila Jagruti Sabir, Mahila Jagruti Shibir. So according to that, uh, there will be women entrepreneurship awareness camp okay for women entrepreneurs where they will be taught about the entrepreneurship skills if they want to create something on their own and sell it and uh, edii we all know about edii that is indian institute of entrepreneurship development that encourages women through the scheme to set up their own industry or their own business so these are the two very important schemes for developing the women entrepreneurship in gujarat which is existing at present and a lot of women are actually taking the help of this initiative and developing their uh, business so looking at the brighter side of things definitely initiatives are taking place and uh, we as a common citizen of this society can actually help people around us to do to take up such initiative, create some awareness among them. Uh, probably we can start with our own mate to you know, tell them that, okay, this is something existing. So that way the society will develop and uh, if the society develop, then we can live in a better place. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amrita, for highlighting the significance of policies. In fact, uh, it is generally taken as uh, it is to remain on paper. And uh, if this is the level of awareness that you're talking, uh, mentioning how to look at the brighter side of the situation, if these 
policies as made are actually being taken to the field and there is participation, then I think uh, uh, that, uh, that better world we can definitely think of for our future generation to come. In order to wind up your last thoughts on this theme, which you think uh, I, you could not express because of uh, certain specific questions that I put to you, I think uh, I keep that uh, the floor open for your last uh, some few words that you want to share or your thoughts. I think I'll start with yeah, you, Dr. Yeah, sure, sure, definitely. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we should encourage and empower women for awareness, training, education. We should support their entrepreneur endeavors emotionally as well as financially. And can I ask one thing that what is the role of the men? Can we sensitize men in helping this gender also to grow up in life? We should work on the I think the entire ecosystem around the girl child right from school and their development should be mentoring, counseling, their development should not be just professionally but personal, professional as well as academical and that will complete the growth of a girl child and that will enable the ladies and the women to enter into or excel into each and every field they enter. Uh, another thing is, she mentioned about the policies, yes, lot of uh, government as well as NGOs, uh, GCCI, uh, Women Wing and Fiki Flow and lot of other uh, NGOs, small NGOs are also working for the gender neutral policies. Uh, government is really giving, uh, they are putting a lot of efforts for women empowerment and uh, I do not know whether we can ask for fee reduction as far as IP rights are concerned or uh, free legal assistance if needed and uh, uh, people like Gopi and uh, Jatin Bhai, they are doing wonderful job for the awareness of IP rights for the women. And so all alternative initiatives are equally important. The workshop, the conferences, uh, the networking for women. So I think uh, all these efforts will help women reaching the newer heights. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. I think uh, uh, one innovative idea that you suggested is how to, uh, how about going for revision of filing fees? I don't know whether we, we make it for women and reduce it. How, how will it be benefiting women directly or there will be again another gender ready to harp on it and take disadvantage out of it. But still, this is an innovative idea. You never know whether it would work or not. We can think about it. Thank you for posing that. And Dr. Lalita, your last words. Yeah, I would emphasize on sensitizing uh, the general public as well as the producers. The general public in the sense because I, in, during my course of teaching at Niper and elsewhere when I given, you know, when I ask what are the regional products, many times the students are not able to come up with answers about the regional products, then you know, the famous regional products of that place. So, I think, so that I think we need to sensitize, yes, these are all the local products and because among the younger generation also, you know, you find they go to a fascinating mall and then purchase something which is there, but we need to educate them about their local regional products and even if you are not going to be buying, so you, know, you feel, you know, feel proud of having one, at least one piece of that. So like they consume, if it is an agricultural product, if it is a food product, so spend some efforts in identifying what is local and try to consume that. And that way I think we will be able to promote uh, because when I, in a, particularly in this field, uh, in, in, a, in this geographical indications field, I feel, uh, as I mentioned before, the size of the country is so huge, but the number of products so far that we have registered are, you know, it's very less. 
No, for that we need to work. For that the sensitization among the producers is also important because if you are not able to do that, there is a huge cultural erosion because even among the registered products we see because of the trend in consumption and the demands of modernization and other things, there are more, not many consumers. So these things will be eroded completely. I think that's where I feel there need to be sensitization among the general public as well as the producers to continue produce and we need to patronize them. So unless there is patronage from this side, there won't be any interest to produce that. So that would be my reflection on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So uh, I would like to take the reference of uh, two of our students from the university uh, who actually while passing their graduation, they published their books individually. And uh, one is uh, Ms. Nupur Ladha. She published a book uh, known as Dear You, where she actually wrote like an expert about how you are going to look into life. Okay, and she was just not even 20 at that time. Uh, but however, that book actually gave a pleasant feeling. And uh, there, there was another girl, uh, Ria Jain, and she published a book known as Life Unplugged. It was about her exposure of looking into life. Now they publish their books, but uh, they publish their book with ISBN okay, number, but I really doubt that how far they are aware about the fact that this is their own book and that comes with their own intellectual property. So uh, when we are looking into the future of the development of this entire thing, I think some kind of education from the school level also should be included. As like we are studying uh, civics, or basic civics or basic social science, I think something about basic ideas about intellectual property or what is copyright or what is trademark or what is uh, geographical indicator or what is uh, you know patent, some knowledge, basic knowledge about these things, if these are given to the school children, um, at least in 10th standard, then this will actually go a long way. Like when they are taking this kind of initiatives, they can know that okay, they can do something like this. They can file a patent. They can do the copyright of their published article or anything. So uh, I think uh, we have to take some positive steps, if at all we are associated with any organization, to include this kind of curriculum uh, for future. Thank you so much, panelists. I think we have spoken about both accomplishments as well as challenges, and how women in IP, this dynamic can be understood from both these lenses. Uh, as WIPO has rightly noted and pointed out, that uh, women continue to face challenges in terms of accessing knowledge, in terms of uh, generating skills, in terms of having resources, in terms of having support that they need. And all these things together certainly make their journey of IP more difficult compared to the other gender. And that is something which is required to be highlighted. And I think, uh, I don't know when will we have uh, those days then these kind of issues would not be there. But at least there is a beginning which has been made and there is this particular realization that one cannot overlook the significant contribution being made by women in terms of innovation and whether that innovation is given a form of IP or not, innovation whenever takes place in society, it generally adds some sort of ease to the human life. So whether it, it reaches that form of IP or not, we do not know. But of course, the society without innovation definitely cannot be imagined. Whatever we are today starting from the, uh, from the phone which was invented by Graham Bell, which we used to use in two hands to the phone, which is a palm size world in our hand, we have come a long way. So the innovation cycle is, is you know, moving every minute, every second. And in this journey of, uh, as I mentioned, in, in this innovation cycle, which is from concept to commercialization, every stage, there is some sort of assistance required. This is not something which might be granted to an individual. 
except geographical indication, all forms of IP, when you recognize them legally, they are granted to individuals. But ultimately, it's not that individual. There are a lot many people who are working as a team. And with that only, it happens. So uh, there are certainly, certainly issues of gender bias. And they are associated with, uh, uh, as I mentioned, starting with education to skill, to resources, to investment to final shape that we want to give to innovation. And when they are being, uh, being addressed appropriately, I think uh, we will be able to say that, yes, women and their role in innovation is being recognized in its true sense. So taking that in our heart, thank you very much for uh, audience for being here. And uh, I have no words to thank the panelists. They have certainly, uh, certainly given an idea about, and they have convinced us as to how innovation Innovation is playing such a significant role in our life, not just life of women, but in our life and for the societal upliftment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Gopi. Sorry? Yes. Any questions? Oh, yes. So before I uh, take up the uh, thank of, uh, final note, I would like audience to you know raise questions if any. Actually, when I uh, see in the field of uh, pharmaceutical patents, when I started with, uh, I didn't find many innovations such as taking, but uh, the, the, in the process of reverse engineering, of course, they were. But, uh, you know, I, we made an interesting comparison of the women innovators. So with a Mexican collaborator, I was working on that. So the process of collecting the data from you know, various patent offices, we collated the number. And it was dismally low. But what at that stage, you know, we, we because uh, the project money was limited, we were not able to do a grand survey of going to different countries. But so handpicked some of the innovators, and uh, she, you know, my Mexican collaborator, she had spoken. So the thing was, many of them were very happy with publishing. So once you have found something, the first thing is to publish. So, but that was <laughs> kind of, you know, they didn't know that, yes, we'll have to wait. So the literacy at that level, because the patents and other things, when it was, you know, after the TRIPS uh, law came in, many people were not realizing, yes, first you rush to the patent office with whatever you, you know, get that initial preliminary uh, thing that you file first. That was missing. But then later, I think the trend, because a lot of, uh, uh, you know, workshops were held, uh, and even, uh, you know, I had uh, gone to companies here uh, and then held these workshops. I think the trend was changing after uh, the 2000, 2012, 13 onwards, there is a different trend. But definitely, the women innovators, number of women innovators was very low. Even if you look at the uh, WIPO reports, you would find that it is very less. And it's partly because, uh, you know, they, when it is a group assignment, you know, when they are working on that, there is one person who is nominated as a leader, and uh, mostly it is uh, the men who are. But you do find, because in our, uh, you know, when we were collecting this number, so most of the time we found the women name to be the second or the third innovator in the list. So, yeah, we'll, we have a long way to go still, I think, in that. But you are right, I think, because uh, financial inclusivity is very, very important. Very, very important. Financial independence, school literacy, everything. And even even my own little experience was that even male, even after being immigrants, you have to get married to a rich guy. Yeah, so I know. So again, the question is that you are Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Any other question?
Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm taking this liberty to answer this question uh, among these able speakers of the day. Uh, from my role or from my profession as a patent attorney, uh, the government and the Patents Act are very vigilant about not being evergreened anything which is being filed. So there is a good scrutiny going on whenever any invention is being examined, right? And there are spe specific provisions which bar those patent applications and refuse them for the grant. So thankfully, in India, evergreening is a complete no-no and we have even borne the hit from the Western countries. A part of that also we have, you know, stood firm and there are specific cases like Novartis case if you have got a chance to read. So we have, you know, stood far in that particular case and we were praised, we were also challenged by having that order in place. You must read Novartis case just to start with and there are various other uh, you know, orders from patent office which we fa which we receive day in day out. I'll not say we, which we face, but we receive day in day out, and we appreciate it. Just to add to, I think just to add to what Gopi said, as a student of law, please read Novartis, and there is a special reference which is made to Section 3D, and Section 3D is prescribing or rather prohibiting, it is part of the exceptions uh, because there is a difference between having uh, conditions for invent invention and conditions for patentability. So it falls in the conditions for patentability, section three and four. And 3D is about how evergreening of patent in India will not be permitted because Novartis is a giant MNC in the field of pharmaceutical. When they came up for such kind of product patent and when we did not have product patent uh, actually established. It was a mailbox system in the earlier regime and we were under the, in that transition when uh, we were uh, going to come out with an amendment to introduce product patent. By the time we introduced, the application was already filed. And how that application is not permitted and not uh, or rather rejected, the, the rationale is not to, not to allow evergreening of patent in India. So their incremental pa uh, part of it also so, and evergreening, both are defined and discussed in detail. One more thing to add is that see, even during the COVID, uh, we were discussing this role of compulsory licensing. So, you know, because uh, the patent law, how we have defined, you know, that we can use all this in the case of public health emergencies. So the evergreening can be curtailed, and that's one of the reasons, you know, the Indian uh, <laughs> patent laws are really criticized by all the multinational companies. So you know, you're a third year law student, but you will have so many cases. And uh, I should say here, the, the NGOs and all played a very vital role in checking such kind of patents. You know, the kind of patents that were uh, uh, registered here, applied for. So we were playing a very good role in curtailing all those even in the initial yes. stages. Compulsory license being issued, and that was also when Bayer was involved, which is an MNC, and uh, it was uh, the uh, the product was for cancer, for liver and kidney, renal related cancer drug. It was, and that was being sold at a very very high price. And uh, of course, but compulsory licensing and evergreening are two separate issues. But when it is being brought to the floor. Uh, as a teacher and you asking as a student, I just could not uh, yes. resist my temptation of bringing this to your notice also because I could see that urge in you to know about it. So read section 84 onwards provision on compulsory licensing. This case, uh, uh, Bayer case, uh, huh, Netco versus, Bayer versus, uh, Netco versus Bayer. And yeah, so that is something which will help you understand how how we are restricting this because uh, patent definitely has a very strong interface with human health and accessibility of medicine. So how to make medicine accessible? We never wanted product patent because with process and product both being granted, there are all chances of the cost of medicine being being uh, much higher. And we are not talking about uh, you know painkillers or paracetamol. We are certainly talking about life-saving drugs and those life-saving drugs like you know 
for which the price would be so high that it would be out of reach. And that's how we have compulsory licensing also. And we also have uh, uh, provisions like Section 3D that can help uh, uh, prohibit evergreening of patent. Yeah, any other question? Yes. Yeah, copyright is one field of IP which is the most abused. But I should say, you know, because the awareness about copyright is also increasing and now with the kind of uh, plagiarism check everywhere, uh, you know, it is now difficult. And uh, once you have proved it is plagiarized, then it is, uh, it's, it's awful. It's awful. And there have been cases where others, you know, the people who have been uh, charged with, they have ended their lives. It goes to such an extent. But yes, you know, in, in, in copyright, if it is translated, that's why I say it is abuse like anything. If it is translated and produced in some language which you are not aware at all, you don't know, you don't even come to know about it. And many times even our articles, we have seen, okay, this sounds like my idea somewhere. So, but there is absolutely no reference to you. So you don't know whether you should feel happy that you have been quoted, but <laughs> quoted, unquoted, the sense your name is not there, you are not being credited. But it is, but what should I say is when you are signing an agreement, these days because the, uh, the uh, publishing houses also, they say, okay, we'll give the right to you. Then it is up to you to manage. If it is, you know, don't come back to me that it has been translated and you are responsible. No. They give the right to you. Then it is up to you to manage. But yes, it is a real task. If it is translated and elsewhere and uh, sent, we don't know. Unless there is a plagiarism check at that point and then found out, yes, there is a similar language and uh, ideas that has been expressed here. I think in the age of chat GPT, <laughs> we must forget copyright now. <laughs> Because it, it's, it's impossible at times to track. But I think uh, uh, I would say that those who actually want to protect their rights, forget copyright or patent or trademark anything. Coming from the field of law, I would say that the law would help only when you are aware, only when you are vigilant. So if you know that you have a right and you have acquired that right, then I think one must not sleep over the right, right? You need to be vigilant. And if you are vigilant, then law is always there to help you. You put it in motion and it will help you. So then every time the law will not come to your place and say, boss, your rights are being violated. You need to know that my rights are being abused. You put the law into motion and things will automatically move. So, so calling this as la <laughs> last question of the session, I would like to thank all the, our distinguished panelists to come over, taking time from their uh, aspiring schedule, I'm not called busy schedule, aspiring schedule, and sharing really valuable thoughts right from uh, how they imbibe, knowingly or unknowingly, how they imbibe intellectual property rights and how they kind of leveraged or encashed into the practice of the professional or including medical career. We entire, the, uh, throughout the session, they talked about what, uh, like how they celebrated those rights, at the same time what, efforts to be made to you know make it more accessible 
including assistance, schemes, etc. I'll just add one or two questions which were left uh, behind by the last words by this uh, panelist, uh, addressing the Darshini Ben's question that can there be any feed reduction? In fact, in last five to six years, there have been a lot of amendments in the laws of intellectual property rights. For an instance, if I start talking about it, again, a few hours can be there. But just an instance, a female inventor, when it's there in the list of inventor, then that particular patent application will be examined faster. Okay, so as we just talked that when there's a group of uh, uh, people working on some project and for some innovative work, a, a female is generally, you know, avoided or neglected and the female even doesn't care about it or not knowingly about her rights, she's happy most of the times. So now there is an inclusion of all those members which were left behind. So these are very, you know, I would say the smart initiatives instead of, you know, paralyzing the, the f f female fraternity by awarding the feed reduction or, you know, giving them uh, schemes. This is a very smart way of including uh, the uh, contribution by the female or women's side. So all such kind of initiatives have been uh, taken and uh, India is one of the f those first countries which is doing this and it is really admired by uh, the other countries also, by WIPO also. So, you know, such positive things are there, but yet we are, uh, we, we as a women are a very submissive gender and IP is very aggressive, right? So you have to claim your rights. You stand up for your right because it is monopolistic in nature. It will not come automatically. So these are two greater mindsets which are coinciding. So I think we'll, we'll put in efforts and we can, you know, conquer it also as we have conquered all other sectors. So thank you once again. Thank you, YJ Trivedi AMA Academy of Intellectual Property Rights for organizing such an apt event for this uh, very auspicious day, which is World Intellectual Property Day. And the theme is also apt. So, you know, we, we the, the this, the uh, center has done an amazing job as governing council member of AMA. I thank all of the participants to spare their time, which is very, it is a peculiar and technical session. So uh, thank you for uh, being here and involving yourself and uh, uh, you know asking certain questions like she asked. You really touched the nerve of the panelists and they rest restrain themselves to answer in a few minutes. Otherwise they can talk about this for hours. So thank you so very much. Have a pleasant evening. Uh, goodbye. Jai Hind. <laughs>